majority, which is in the majority phase, or even in the distress situation, when the company is just about to get into IBC or has already been filed for IBC, at all these stages, valuation plays a very, very important role. Besides that, there are various legislations which mandate valuation to be carried out under various provisions of the company that under income tax act, under SEBI regulations, under FEMA, various other laws require valuation on a mandatory basis for various aspects of business transactions which are required to be carried out by all of them. Therefore, valuation profession is emerging as one of the central and most critical profession in the financial markets across the world. If you look at the m and space, mergers and acquisitions, no mergers and acquisition deal can happen without there being an appropriate valuation carried out by an expert valuer with regard to the assets of the target company. And this valuation determines what is the purchase consideration to be paid or what is going to be the share swap ratio to be decided between the two companies, that is the acquired company and the target company. Valuation, how much value you end up paying for acquiring a company plays a critical role in determining whether going forward, the acquiring company would be able to generate the expected synergy or not. Mergers and acquisitions are kind of marriages between two businesses, where one company acquires the business of another company with a view to leveraging the resources, the branding, the product profile of the other company towards building up a greater business entity. If one company has a turnover of 100 crores, the other company has a turnover of 50 crores, after merger, it is expected that the turnover is going to be more than 150 crores, more than the sum of the algebraic sum of the turnovers of the two companies at any given point of time. Therefore, it is vital that valuations are carried out very, very carefully by following consistent, universal, applicable principles. That is why there is need for enforcing the valuation standards until the time in India, we are able to evolve our own valuation standards. All of us are as of now following the international valuation standards, which have been promulgated by IBSC. All of you would be aware that IBSC has come out with the next edition of valuation standards, updated version, which is becoming mandatory for application with effect from 31st of January, 2022. But they have already released the document. I think it's time and it's important for all of us to kindly carefully go through that document, understand what are the changes. There are some deletions, some additions, some modifications at different places so that we are prepared to mandatorily apply those changed version of valuation standards effective from 31st of January, 2020. Whatever discipline we might be from, whichever asset class, valuation is key in today's economic development and economic growth. And we know that valuation is not only about technical skills. It is as much and maybe more of human skills where the judgment, hunch, gut feeling plays a very important part. Because valuation is not an objective process of working out some kind of numbers, doing some kind of financial modeling, and then you get the output as a whole number, which you say is the valuation. It's not as simple as that, unfortunately. Numbers are only the starting point, but not the end point of valuation process. We get the numbers, we look at the numbers, and then we have to create and weave a story around those numbers. It is the story which ultimately reflects the valuation of the company. Because we all understand that we, the financial statements that we prepare, they only capture one kind of capital that is financial capital. But the emerging dimensions of corporate reporting now across the world talk about integrated reporting where they are talking about six different types of capital, which are required to be considered while arriving at the valuation of a company or valuation of a business. The other capitals which are considered under integrated reporting framework are 
human capital, social and relational capital, natural capital, intellectual capital, manufactured capital, and that's how we are able to work out the valuation of any given business. Valuation is dependent upon what is the price that the buyer is willing to pay. And of course, the price is going to be determined by the negotiation between the buyer and the seller. It is also concerned with cost. What has been the cost of building up an asset, which is probably getting transferred from one person to another now. And therefore, valuation is a challenge of integrating price, cost, and value. The price what you pay right now is the price that goes out of your hands, but then value is what you get. And value is nothing but expected future economic benefits that you are likely to derive from acquiring an asset. But if you look at the basic question, why should any asset have a value? Why should we be paying something for acquiring that particular asset? I think what is important is that the product or the service, which is valuable, it must have utility. It must have the ability or capacity to be able to fulfill some of our needs and wants. Second aspect is the product or service, which is carrying some kind of value. It must be scarce. If there is something which is in abundant supply or supply far exceeds the demand for the product or service, I don't think it's going to carry value in the marketplace. And the third aspect is that it must be transferable. It should be capable of being transferred from one entity to another or one person to another. That's the three important characteristics that we have with regard to any product or service to be carrying any kind of value. So when we look at valuation, we obviously have to make projections about the future. What kind of cash flows the company is going to have? What kind of turnover the company is going to have? What kind of customer profile? What kind of market share the company is able to generate? And then, of course, we apply one of the three or maybe all the three techniques, approaches, the income approach, the market approach, the cost approach, with a view to working out the value of a company at a given point of time. Of course, it may at times be difficult to arrive at a precise value for a particular asset, but normally, definitely, we are able to work out some kind of a dream. That value is going to lie between this value and this value, even if we are not able to specify one particular number of value for a particular product or for a particular business. So valuation is all about the value of any asset. It lies in the eyes of the beholder. Different people can probably offer different price for the same product, depending upon how urgent is their requirement, how desperate they are with regard to acquiring of that particular asset. And that's why we say the value of a particular asset might at times differ from person to person. It obviously also differs from time to time. If you look at the valuation of any company in 2018, and you compare that with the valuation of the company now in 2021, in the post-COVID-21-19 situation, is going to be hugely different, either on the upside or on the downside. Because on account of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, many businesses have benefited, many businesses have been negatively impacted. But either way, you look at the total value of a business in pre-COVID and post-COVID scenario is going to be hugely different. So how do we look at valuation in the post-COVID scenario? What kind of adjustments we require to be making? What kind of new approaches we need to look at? ICMAI RBO has come out with a guidance note on impact of valuation, impact on valuation of COVID. And we have floated this amongst all the RVs, all the professionals to give their feedback and comments. After that, the said guidance note is going to be released for general guidance of the public. The point that I'm making here is that in this current financial world across the world, valuation plays a central role and a very, very important and key role in various kinds of financial dimensions, which keep happening all the time 
24 into 7 across the world. With this brief introduction with regard to theme of the today's session, I would now request the chief guest, Shri CMA Rakesh Singh Ji, to kindly address us all. And then, of course, we have the keynote speaker of today, Mr. Ellen Rugardo from Uganda Kampala, who is going to talk to us with regard to technical session that we're going to have, followed by the chief guest address, CMA Shri Rakesh Singh Ji. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Good evening to everyone. Uh, to my friend from Uganda, Alan. And uh, let me start uh, first by uh, appreciating uh, Dr. Gupta, because uh, whatever I'm going to say, I'm going to say in uh, three parts. Part one is specifically referred towards uh, ICMAIRVO and uh, Dr. Gupta leading that. Uh, it has been a wonderful experience in uh, last one year or so. All of the participants must also be realizing that though we started a little bit uh, slow, but now you see that uh, ICMI RVO is almost in the leading position. And we are actually the torch bearers now in the valuation standards and also valuation processes uh, in India today. With our direct participation and uh, our linkage with IVSC, we have uh, in any uh, uh, way adopted the IVSC for our own members. But at the same time, like Dr. Gupta was saying, that we have now come out with the guidance notes. And also, we are in uh, process of preparing the in many of the areas, uh, guidance uh, uh, notes and uh, checklists and uh, how the documentation is to be done. Basically trying to help all our members to get their uh, jobs done in a proper way, which is acceptable and uh, not only acceptable, but uh, beneficial to the, uh, like Dr. Gupta said, to both the parties of buyers and sellers. But in my point of view, there is another third uh, stakeholder who is an investor. Yeah, that's right. Because let us understand the process of buying and selling now, and uh, especially in the Indian context, all of you will be realizing that uh, many of the prophets of doom who were talking about India will be left behind in the progress due to pandemic has actually now eating their words because now the uh, prospects and the forecasts, even the best of the uh, people are now talking about between 7 to 8%. Even the government prediction is between 8 to 9%. Because, but I'm convinced somehow that it's going to be very, very near to 10%, even a little bit over 10% in by 2023. Now, this is the kind of piece where uh, Indian uh, business maturity level and the kind of investments which are now coming in, which is uh, you will find that in last seven, eight months, it's almost 27% growth in FDI. And these uh, FDIs are not only coming uh, through the equity route, because the government of India with the PLI scheme is now, and uh, with the Make in India processes and many of the manufacturing big units, including technology units who are basically having their stakes in our uh, neighboring countries or possibly China, and every place, they are coming back to India. And India now everyone considers, it's not say developing, but middle income developing uh, country now. With this kind of a scenario, uh, my first part ends by appreciating Dr. Gupta and his team for taking the leadership position in our country, where we are now uh, playing a very vital role with a great linkage and a very fruitful linkage with the IVSC so that our membership and all Indian valuers get the benefit of it. The second part, I come to the question of uh, business valuations and the challenges and aspirations, what the topic has been selected for today. In fact, if you look at the challenge, why we talk about challenge? Because this is a profession where the sky is a limit, but even the sky is a limit the kind of opportunities we have. But why do we need to talk about challenges? 
we need to talk about challenges. What we have been discussing is because the things are changing so fast, like Dr. Gupta said, he talked about and gave a reference of integrated reporting. Friends, many of us may not be aware, but whosoever is aware must also be knowing that the process of this integrated reporting has been going on for over a decade and a half now. And by 22, 23, almost uh, India's all listed companies are being targeted to come out with their IR reports. Why these IR reports are important and why we say it, or why the topic of uh, uh, the word challenges comes to the fore of it. Because integrated reporting basically targets not only the three M's what we have been talking about, money, uh, material and machines, the three factors of production, but it talks about seven C's. That is what uh, Dr. Gupta was referring to, where social, intellectual, manufactured, natural, these resources come on the fore. And we are now getting to the next level. Uh, today, possibly all of you might be aware that businesses or rather uh, uh, everyone talks in businesses or business enterprises having a primary motto or the central theme as corporate governance. Because wherever and whichever company has a better corporate governance uh, creates a better belt or higher wealth. And this is where the people are more interested that whatever company is having the best corporate governance policies, they are supposed to be the better one. But now there will be a little bit of a change. Let us understand this. What the IR talks about is, it talks about not only the corporate governance, but it talks about responsible investment. Now responsible and informed investment is going to take over the primary role of uh, creation of wealth, running of businesses, investment directed towards uh, ESG uh, uh, complied uh, business enterprises across the globe. Why? Because people and the investors, the big investors are realizing that what we used to call it, that uh, island of prosperity cannot remain isolated in the sea of poverty. It means if you want to have a prosperity, you have to take need of the society into account. It is not possible for any business enterprise or any organization to benefit, to continue to create profit, to be sustainable if its surrounding is not being supported or mutually not supported by each other. Now, this concept globally, you will be you will be uh, watching very carefully how the concerns about green energy are coming in the forefront. Now we'll be seeing all the uh, world leaders now talking about green energy, talking about environment, talking about carbon credits. Even though these terms were used previously, uh, but in a very limited way. But now the quantum of the development which is taking place and the rate of adoption of these parameters of growth necessitates that every valuer when entering into any kind of valuation process must understand what are the integrated forms of these seven capitals instead of only having a profit, only an income method, cost method and fair market price. Okay, fair enough. But at the same time, all these three factors are going to be impacted by those seven Cs, what Gupta Ji uh, referred to a little bit uh, ago. I think this is the reason why challenges world has been put into, I think, this topic. The another challenge, what I, uh, I foresee is for the ICMI RVO, to upgrade itself, because unless it upgrades itself in the IR reporting and the values created through those reporting, what are those seven Cs, how they are going to impact? I think we need to move 
or uh, have a peace, um, which uh, possibly may be uh, not very comfortable for any ordinary person. But then at the same time, the world is not going to be ordinary, uh, ordinary also after this pandemic. So the leadership positioning, if we want to make, I think the seven C's concept, I think uh, ICMI, RU, and India in particular should take a lead. And uh, once again, I'm referring because personally I'm aware that Dr. Gupta has already uh, making effort, uh, effort and uh, we are part of it that we are trying to approach the relevant government agencies yes. uh, for uh, their uh, consent, their feedback, their inputs, so that the kind of guidance and the standards, even in the valuation, what we are going to frame in future, they are uh, in conformity, in linkage with the government philosophy of integrated development, sabka saath, sabka viswas. With this kind of a statement and make in India, what we are trying to do now is to come up with the developmental ideas, developmental standards, which integrates the social issues and not only the profit or the uh, market prices, which are determined based upon whether EP, uh, EPS or whatever thing they, we talk about, whatever the earnings per share or these things or that thing. But it needs to be integrated with the social uh, impact of those profits and the sustainability impact of that profit. This was part number two. The last thing or the part three is, since my friend Alan is there and he will also appreciate that this global integration of the all economies of the world is making a sort of a, what we used to know that it's a global village, but actually it's not a global village. When we talk about enterprises, when we talk about seven C's, when we talk about the capitals, we are talking about the best of all these combining together and making a new world culture of business, a new business culture, which will be having a global impact in such a mass scale that they can, uh, what uh, we might have never seen. Imagine the best of workers, the best of capital and the best of minds just joining hands and creating a monolith. What will happen in those circumstances? So we, those things are left in future. But the challenges in future valuations and for valuers is to understand that what kind of impact every capital what we define now in the IR reporting, where we will be discussing more and more, because as part of the uh, GRI groups and part of IR uh, council, I have seen that. And uh, still I try to understand how the things are moving around. We need to work a lot. We have to make a lot of it, but we have to raise our vision. We have to raise our vision from profit to value, which is a huge, huge change. And in future, when these seven capitals will become more important than the uh, profit, income, or cost, I think that will be the real challenge. And the last one of the aspirations, yes, why not? Aspirations on the part of ICMA RVO, I can tell you that uh, Gupta is working day in and day out to make ICMA RVO as a real leader in India. And the one single point of information for all my friends who are attending today and who might uh, be attending in future also. And we must become the central point and central theme for IVSC also yes. as a single nodal agency to disseminate knowledge. Aspirations on the part of the RVOs, why are we only talking about, or why should we talk about India? Because our, our concept of uh, global uh, uh, market also confirms to our own Hindu philosophy where sari dunya hi hamari hai. So we have to be global looking with having a global views. The whole global market needs Indian capital, intellectuals, our and our views. So we, in the form of, uh, you know, uh, uh, practice also, 
it's not only india when the indian invest companies are going outwards or looking outwards because few years back only foreign companies were looking towards india but understand now even now indian companies are looking outwards so along with the indian companies along with the indian capital also we will be needing indian valuers who will be valuing the acquisitions and mergers in out of the indian uh, jurisdiction so i think that's the aspiration all of you should be having the third is uh, the third aspirations on the part of the uh, allen and uh, for all other people of the global value valuer says that we have to develop ourselves with the new reality because the globe is changing businesses are changing places of businesses are changing the way businesses are being done they are changing therefore the way value is being created like i said investors don't need the kind of investment only for profit investors don't need a uh, profit making exercise for few years and after that it's a um, yeah, our business is going out of uh, the scale what informed investors want now is be sustainable be responsible to the society take the society with you that's where all of us survive i quoted like say that uh, that uh, a small island of prosperity cannot remain in the ocean of poverty so there has to be some socialism within the capitalism itself to survive both the society uh, social survival of each other and that's where the challenge in and aspirations of all three parts of today's stakeholder icmi ivsc and definitely all of you friends together we will make the best out of it yes. thank you dr gupta for giving me this opportunity i hope some of the things whatever i have said yes, uh, are relevant and Absolutely. maybe we'll be continuing with this idea sure, sir. thank you once again sure, and once again i welcome alan for is uh, coming and joining with us and we will i hope that this friendship this relationship will continue and will meet again and again thank, thank you, you. thank you so much cma rakesh singh ji the chief guest of today's program who has always been a guide mentor and advisor to us in our activities and endeavors and the kind of futuristic talk that he has given the kind of thoughts that he has thrown over to us i mean all of these have lot of content in terms of depth of his thinking and the thought process he is actually thinking in terms of internationalizing the indian business and for that we require change in thinking integrated reporting is not only a report which integrates the writing part of it it actually starts with integrated thinking how do we convert ourselves from profit to the value focus that's the key success mantra for the corporate world going forward on a sustainable basis that's the key message given by cma shri rakesh singh sir thank you very much for sparing your valuable time and being with us and sharing with us your such a huge and significant futuristic perspective thing now i would like to introduce the keynote speaker of today mr allen from uganda kampala who is holding a degree in valuation from university of dar es salaam and who is a member who is a masters in business administration from isami business school ellen is a registered valuer and works as an advocate of high court of uganda also ellen is a member of membership and standards recognition board of ibsc and is also director of school of development sciences of east africa ellen it's a pleasure to welcome you to this web session where you are going to be talking to registered valuers and other professionals of india and we would like to share your international experience with regard to valuation for the future the challenges and aspirations Alan, over to you. I thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Gupta, Dr. Gupta, for that kind introduction. I also want to extend my thanks to our guest of uh, honor today, uh, Mr. Rakesh Singh. Uh, thank you very much for those very, very forecasting, uh, you know, uh, comments and ideas. And uh, I almost thought that actually you are going to deliver the technical report from 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 what you are what you are discussing. 
I extend, uh, Ms. Dr. Gupta and your members, I extend uh, 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 greetings uh, from the Valuation Committee in Uganda. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, you know that Uganda and India have got a very, very long history. Yes. Uh, dating back uh, pre-1900. Yes. Uh, where we're working together with developing infrastructure. And later, obviously, you know that a lot of uh, capital, a lot of uh, entrepreneurship that is in Uganda and in Africa is, uh, is, is from India. So we are really brothers, and I'm really happy to, Thank to you. be here talking Thank you. to you. And, and I hope that we learn something together. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Gupta, I'm requesting to share my presentation. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. You can share it on the screen, please. Okay. Okay, so can, can, can everyone see that? It is, it is appearing, yes. It is appearing, yes. Okay, so very good. So my presentation is more of a conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it a mind-tickling conversation, yeah? So I want our, our members here to just be broad-minded and listen to what I have to say and then see whether at the end of the day we can have a discussion on how to, how to move forward. So again, um, I'm representing the School of Real Estate and Infrastructure Development Sciences, and I won't labor into that, but if anyone needs uh, any details, you can reach us on our website, which I'll share later. So in the course of this discussion, I want to just talk to about the following areas. I want to talk about the traditional value, who uh, our guest of, uh, of, uh, of, of honor has referred to. I want to talk about the new dawn, in my view, when I look at what is happening on the international scene, what comes to me in terms of what does the professional value need to look out for? I will also talk about what I'm calling the client of the future. Uh, our guest of honor has told us that businesses are changing, people are changing, and it's not, it's not about running after profits, it's about running for value. So I'll talk about that. I'll also not leave everyone in the room uh, lost, but I'll talk about the, what I call the innovation clock. If innovation were a clock, then what are the different components of it and what role can we play at, at, at different levels? Then I'll also talk about the worst case scenario. If we sit and do nothing, what is likely to, to, to happen to us? And then we shall sign off by talking about what I think we should do and then any ray of hope that comes to mind. So please indulge me in the following uh, slides. And I thank you very much again. So, uh, Dr. Gupta and our guest of honor, in my view, the traditional valuer is the following. The valuer who thinks about fixed assets, the valuer who thinks about fixed methods, the valuer who relies on a fixed curriculum of training, and the valuer who does not think of, of time in terms of movement and trend, but thinks of time in terms of now. And finally, a valuer who thinks of a fixed market and doesn't have a broad sense of understanding what a property market is or a, a, an asset market is. So for me, this valuer should not have been able to go beyond the 1990s. So after 1990, every valuer and every school training valuers needed to have put this aside and started to follow the global uh, trend that is changing and matching into something else. And we shall talk about that. So this is my starting point. Let's see how things are changing. Our guest of honor and members, the new dawn for me is that we are not talking about assets in isolation. Yeah? For example, materials, machines, and so on and so forth. We are talking about going concerns because everyone is deploying and wants to be part of something that is deploying capital to come out of something. So it's no, it's no longer components of assets, it's going concerns. So issues of business valuation start to take center stage. Um, next is that. Uh, we are so awash by the technology movement that uh, they are now classified technology assets and there is a intellectual property. So there are now concerns that like how can this be given a value, an accurate value, and a value that is standard, whether in Japan, New York, Kampala, or Hyderabad. We're talking about brands and labels. Yeah. So a brand like Coca-Cola, uh, how do you begin putting a value on that? A brand like Pepsi Cola. How do you begin to go to a value of like that? There are labels, labels of uh, successful people, labels of successful drinks, labels of successful foods. How do you put values on all these things? So for me, that's where the, the, the real thing is hidden. Now, we are talking about borderless markets. So if I'm valuing a resort, probably in a nice beachfront town in, in, uh, in India, and I want to put a figure on it, 
Uh, that resort gets uh, customers all the way from New York to London to to Macau and everything that, uh, or, or, and, and, and things like that. So, how do you fix a, a market for that particular resort? Yeah, and the products that we are seeing these days are products that are breaking the consumption, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, definition. These are products that can be enjoyed by very many people in different areas. Yeah, so there are markets that you probably have your products that you don't know about even at this point in time. Then, of course, we're talking about biological assets. Yeah? So it's becoming a big issue that we should be able to put a, a value on, for example, the wildlife in Uganda, yeah? or the wildlife in the Congo, or the wildlife in India. Yeah? And I'm talking about forests, I'm talking about swamps, I'm talking about uh, uh, national parks and things like that. So if someone accidentally knocked down an elephant, yeah? and he was judged to have been in the wrong, what value would he pay the government or the society that, that that elephant was living in and enjoying visitors and tourists because it was there? Those kinds of things are not in place. So, and when I hear the, the chief guest talk about integrated markets and integrated uh, uh, approach, integrated thinking, I think that we are now talking to the right people and this is where we should be talking about. So, having understood that the dawn is moving from fixed assets but into deploying these assets into so many intangibles, then what do we need to do as professionals? So let's go ahead. So it means that also, if you agree with me on the change of the markets, that the client also likely to change. Now, in my view, the client in the future won't be asking you a value at a fixed date in time. He will be asking you a value uh, in trend. So for instance, if I want to find out um, uh, the price or the value on the Hyderabad or the Mumbai uh, national public space located at some point, right? I will say, I'm giving you instructions to give me the value of this asset from 2015 all the way up to 2035. So do we have the skill to do trend valuation? And if we don't have it, what do we need to be doing? Number two is that people will be asking you for movements in value in and out of different growth options. So if I say, give me the, the valuation uh, from now onwards for the next 15 years of whether I should put my money in treasury bills in Africa, or I should put it in metals in Singapore, or I should go and buy uh, some shares in a telecom company in, in, in Mexico. And you should, can you draw for me uh, you know, curves that are, are able to make me make a decision at this point in time? That's what the next client is going to be asking for. And they'll come to you and sit in your office in, uh, in Mumbai, but they'll be asking you questions of what's happening in New York, what's happening in Singapore, what's happening in London, in South Africa, in Kampala, and so on and so forth. If we don't have this skill, what do we need in order to develop this? We need to be starting to learn that. Then we, we just talked about that value is now cutting across continents, all right? So maybe Microsoft is, a, is an American company. Google is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an American company. Tata is an Indian company, and so on and so forth. But these companies and brands have got markets in almost every community globally, all right? Look at, look, look at something like, say, for example, if I ask you a question and say, can you give me the value of Microsoft India? Or can you give me the value of Tata South Africa? Or can you give me the value of, uh, you know, of Google in Ghana, for instance, all right? So those are the kind of questions that I think people are going to be asking in the future. What, what are we doing now to prepare ourselves to be able to comfortably provide guidance and that is based on global practice in this respect? The other thing that I'd like to specify is that the client, the, the client of the future might need component value, even in the complexity of these new products and assets that are coming on board. So I'll just give you an example. Let's go again to you think about in your mind, just try and conceptualize the operation of Coca-Cola, a global uh, soft drink manufacturer, okay? So if I come to you and I say, I want you to break down for me the value of Coca-Cola global into the following components. First of all, give me the intellectual property for our recipes for all our products. Secondly, uh, give me uh, the entire machinery and production component. Number three, give me the brand value uh, of Coca-Cola uh, per, per, per continent. Uh, brand value America, brand value Europe, brand value Africa, brand value Asia, 
run run in Australia. And then finally, I would also like you to be able to uh, let me uh, have an understanding of the downstream value we are supporting in terms of the value chain of distributing our product to our, to our customer. You imagine such a complex consultancy, yet it's practical. Yeah, this is information that a company that size should be having. So what schemes are we putting in place to make sure that we can answer all these difficult questions? And of course, I really love the, the particular point out uh, that our chief guest talked about in terms of uh, prosperity not being able to survive in a sea of poverty. And that brings us to the concept of, of ESG, the environmental social governance. Yeah? And, and that also that brings me down to the concept of environmental and social value. Are we ready? Do we believe we are ready? Do we have the body of knowledge that is able to help us start putting together ideas, formulas, and approaches for environmental and social valuation? These are all questions that I want us to start forecasting on as we do our R&D in terms of developing our position. So this is an interesting one for me. Mr. Jeff Kest and members out there, this is my, uh, my uh, understanding of of how innovation can help us. And if it's going to help us, how can we be the different spooks in the tire that's going to drive innovation? So for me, in my view, I will say that if innovation were a clock, you know, a clock you put on a wall to tell you the time, right? So if innovation were a clock, then the face of the clock on which everything sits, in my view, is us understanding that evaluation is a market uh, is a global market and therefore we should have a global perspective. Once we agree and understand and appreciate that we operate in a global perspective as professional players, then we've already met the first stage of innovating ourselves. And that is the face of the clock. Then the hour hand, you know, the, the, the hand which tell, tells the hour, in my view, would be the legal uh, regime and the different standards that you all have in your different jurisdictions. But remember that if you have appreciated the first one as the face of the clock being a global perspective of our market, it would mean that the hour hand, therefore, which is a legal regime and standards, should try tending towards having a uniform international outlook. So we start smoothening our legal regimes between Uganda and India, India and the, and, and the, uh, and the UK, the UK and Australia, and so on and so forth. Once we start even in that and even in standards, we shall be heading into that. And then in my view, gentlemen and ladies, is that if there was a minute hand, which there is on the innovation club, that minute hand would be tertiary training reforms. Yeah. So most of our universities are running a curriculum for valuation and the related uh, aspects and courses that is dated more than 25, 30 years ago. And yet we agree to each other that the market has moved that the players have moved, that the understanding has moved, that the distribution of the asset has moved on. So why are we in the hang of that? Still training people in all the uh, discourse and it will be all new discourse that is going to be done. Then, uh, Mr. Guest of Honor, um, the, the second hand of our, of our clock for me will be research and development. So if we identify research questions in each of our different cohorts, and start contributing to each of them one by one, slowly by slowly, and sharing that information. Then we make it easier, we make it cheaper, and we ride on each other's back and experience. And then finally, if the innovation clock needed a battery, that battery is going to be you, it's going to be me, it's going to be everyone else in this room. So that is my view in terms of how uh, we can take an advantage of the space. The worst case scenario is very simple. If you do nothing, you're headed for irrelevance, what we call the fossil effect. Yeah? All of you know companies like Nokia and Kodak were once very big entities, but because of not understanding change and changes in their market and work environment, they have had challenges coping up. Then you start getting expatriate expertise, where you are in India and they're getting people from outside the country to come to do work that you would have done yourself. And obviously this doesn't promote uh, the local profession, and neither does it say well about whether uh, we all understand what we're doing in this different we're in. I would rather go for what the, the, the chief guest talked about, 
by telling us and encouraging us that rather than working locally, we should be looking at getting uh, you know, the, re the, 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 the requisite knowledge to be able to work outside, outside our boundaries. Um, next would be, uh, if we don't do anything, then obviously all these small areas of knowledge are likely to start getting people who start posing as if they're experts in each of them. And before you know it, you've diluted uh, the, the, the evaluation, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, profession, and you've created very many weak small professional chapters. None of them can stand strong on their own, and therefore, at the end of the day, are uh, secure in the future for each of them becomes very, very, very Obviously, it goes without saying that we shall lose opportunity in the developed markets because we won't have the competence to work there. And then obviously it would mean that sadly we shall have imbalances of VPOs. VPOs are, are voluntary professional organizations at different global uh, uh, levels. So when you go for, for example, an international conference, you wouldn't have a lot to contribute there. Uh, you, you simply be reduced in, in, into a spectator because you're not sharing much knowledge. And even if and whatever is being discussed at that level is probably too complicated for you. So those are the fears, but not to paint a bad picture, but just to show us that if we do nothing, we are likely to gravitate into this kind of scenario. So what should we do? In my view, and following the guidance of Mr. Gupta and, the, and our chief guest, I would simply say broaden practice space. Yeah. So think international, think global, and everything, all right? So broaden that space. If it's a swimming pool, you're widening it such that you can have a lot of room to do as much as you want. Right. The second one I would like everyone to think about, which probably no, no one has talked about before, is I encourage people to pursue multidisciplinary training and backgrounds. Yeah? So if you're going to be an expert valuer in uh, plant and machinery, you're going to be an expert valuer in intellectual property, you're going to be an expert valuer in, uh, in the aviation industry, you're going to be an expert valuer in, uh, in, 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 in all those different areas. It is important that the valuer should have more than one professional standing. Yeah? So if you imagine you're a valuer and you're also an engineer, imagine you're a valuer and you're also a lawyer, that you're a valuer and you're also a procurement expert, that you're a valuer and you're also an aviation expert, that puts you in a higher category of understanding and articulating issues in your sector that you have chosen uh, to advance yourself in. So that for me is important. And if universities and young people are encouraged to get dual qualification, then they will become better practitioners because their level of understanding will be much higher than each of these in their independent practice journeys. Then I like to say that over above all, have a bad style view of everything. And, 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 and try as much as, as possible to learn much about other sectors, especially what I refer to as the built environment. You see, the built environment, Mr. Gupta, the chief guest and members here, has got about 11 to 12 chapters of people. Yeah? You, if you won't talk about any dam, any road, any, any major you know, piece of real estate, any major housing project, before you talk about architects, before you talk about urban planners, before you talk about land surveyors, before you talk about cost engineers, before you talk about civil engineers, before you talk about structural engineers, before you talk about procurement experts, before you talk about lawyers, before you talk about finance experts. So all of this is space we should be thinking in, or at least we should know how these people think. If we are to give a bad side view understanding that now represents what we call a market condition. Then I'd like to add on that uh, we need to remember that everything about creating value, creating markets and uh, innovation and all these things are being driven by two opposing things. One thing, urbanization. Yeah, the globe is trending into an urban community. Yeah, uh, some, some figures are suggesting that in the next 50 years, 80% of the globe will be living in an urban environment. So that's one pressure, pulling on one side. On the other hand, we have the environment yeah, that is saying you need to be, you need to exploit the environment sustainably. So those are the two major pillars that should inform, you know, uh, the thinking of everyone in that is participating in the built environment. So when you when you're thinking of change, you're thinking of uh, 
of, uh, of coping with change, the feeling of understanding the new customer, just always remember urbanization and unsustainable exploitation of the environment and natural resources. And then obviously, we need to learn and unlearn in order to learn. Uh, that's as simple as it is. So you don't know enough until you discover that you don't know, and then at that point you start uh, knowing. And that's a continuous process, and I challenge everyone to be uh, you know, simple enough to themselves to always remember that however much you are an expert at something, there is something more that you need to learn. So with that perspective, let me just talk about finally what I'm calling the ray of hope. The ray of hope is again uh, something that uh, we're all stepping on to give us a, a, a position of being able to do what we want to do uh, for the future. So some, some of these things look big and, and they look given, but they, are, they, are, they help us uh, appreciate what we are doing, especially if when you start seeing things from an, an international perspective. So the first one is that there is relatively global peace. I think we all agree that the world is substantially at peace. Yeah? There are pockets of war and, and strife in different areas, but the world is substantially at peace. The America is, in, is, is at peace. Uh, Europe is at peace. Australia is at peace. Africa, about 80, 85% is, is at peace, and so on and so forth. What does it mean? It means that you can move markets, you can move products, you can move ideas, you can move capital. Yeah? So that means that you have the entire the entire globe to think about. Number two, sovereignty of nations. Yeah. So if nations are sovereign and there is equal recognition of sovereignty, it means that we are protected by laws and we are protected, protected by the, the dignity that we, we give each other as human beings. Once we start doing that, then we go into point number two, which is a global institutional network that we have. For us in our area, you know, we have United Nations, which is supporting our cause in UN Habitat and, and, and so many other uh, you know, projects and uh, platforms. We have the FIG, the, the, the International Federation of Geomatic Experts. Again, there's a lot of research and a, a lot of aggregation of experts in that area, including valuation, which is very helpful uh, in order to push the global agenda of standardization. Um, all of you obviously must have heard of the International Valuation Standards Council, uh, whose major uh, mandate right now is to elevate the international practice standard into a single file as much as possible. And a lot of energy is being done by very, very uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, gifted and expert uh, uh, and advisors at different levels trying to make sure that we level this uh, playing field. Number three is that uh, it is not for granted that we're able to exchange knowledge. Yeah? So for example, I'm here sharing my experience in Kampala, and you're probably there, you're going to share your experience in India. And, and this is beautiful. It, it, we are doing it not out of expectation of, of anything, but we are doing it out of the need to elevate our profession to a higher level. And I'm really very happy again, Dr. Gupta Kratin is a uh, uh, very noble opportunity. Number four, ladies and gentlemen, is that there is ICT based networking. So I don't have to be on a plane, uh, flying all the way across uh, half the globe, landing in India. Uh, and you know, looking for a hotel, or it would be fun, obviously, I'd like to be there and so on and so forth. But, but we can also have this this way. So we spend two hours chat, chatting, exchanging, and this can take us forward. When we have to meet, then we can meet. But let's exploit all these networking platforms that we have now, who our forefathers never had before, to make sure that we harness all our talents in order to get us into the future. And finally, is that there is a lot of courtesy among these professionals and comradeship. So if some of you go for this in, in, in international conferences, everyone, as long as you're in a room as an expert and you're here to share knowledge and learn from others, everyone is accessible, everyone is simple, everyone is there to help, everyone is positive, and things like that. We need to utilize and exploit this comradeship and courtesy between and among us as professionals to make sure that we lift ourselves uh, um, uh, to the next level. I thank you very much uh, for giving me uh, this opportunity, and I really look forward to, to your questions, interactions, comments, and the, and the wider conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gupta, please unmute.
Thank you so much, Mr. Mugish Turiya Kayu Allen, for your very, very thoughtful, insightful perspectives on future of valuation, the challenges and aspirations. Very, very great idea that you've got to move from local to global, and you have to think at a wider, at a broader framework. That's what the message is quite clear. I would request now the house is open for question answer, interactions kind of thing. Any observations, any questions that you may like to take from the chief speaker of today's evening, you're most welcome to. Anyone may kindly start, please. Mr. Mugisha, may I ask you a question, please? Uh, what is the level of assimilation and understanding of the framework of international valuation standards in your country or your part of the region? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, uh, valuation practice uh, in, in our region is run by uh, uh, four, four VPOs. So in Uganda, we have the Institutional Surveyors of Uganda, uh, which became a member of the of the of the IVSC in 2014. We have the the, the, the institution of surveyors of Kenya, which has been a, a, a member of the of IVSC even much earlier, probably 2005 or six. And then we have TVEA, which is the, the Tanzanian Institute of Valuers and Estate uh, Agents. All right, that one is not yet a member, but it is one of the members that I, I, I am quoting as a proxy of the IVSC here on the board. And then we also have the, the Institution of Real Property Valuers of Rwanda, which also is one of the members that I am quoting. So in the countries that have, that have, that have adopted uh, the, the IDSC outlook and, uh, and, and, and standards, especially Kenya, uh, there is a substantial level of compliance and understanding of uh, the reason for the campaign and the technical aspects of it, and the, obviously, uh, now, what we are trying to do now is to make it part and parcel of training at tertiary level, but also number two, we also try to look at how to develop more continuous professional uh, trainings uh, uh, year, year on year that can help both the in in practice and the and the graduate members into getting a holistic uh, uh, you know uh, uh, appreciation of why they are uh, agitating for national standards. Thank you. You know, uh, we are all impacted by COVID-19 pandemic situation across the world. It has changed the way we live our lives, the way we do business today. It has impacted lives of the people. It has impacted livelihood. And it has also impacted lives of the various firms. What kind of adjustments, what kind of adaptation you are making now in the post-COVID scenario or in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic scenario while carrying out valuation? Are you making some kind of changes in your valuation approaches, valuation techniques? What are the kind of factors that you're considering now, which probably you were not considering earlier before the outbreak of unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic situation? Can you kindly share your practical experience? What changes, what modifications, what adaptations you are making to the valuation principles in today's COVID-19 pandemic impacted world for carrying out valuation? Okay, um, yeah, that's a very interesting scenario. So, um, uh, so COVID obviously came, first of all, abruptly, and none of us decided the level and depth of how disruptive it would be uh, to our to our economy and obviously to our markets. Yeah, but I'd like to mention that uh, Africa has substantially been uh, re resilient to COVID. And I'll tell you just a few things that um, um, apart from uh, the, uh, the infections, obviously, and apart from the cost of healthcare, which was very high, and obviously the, the losses that we suffered, compared to other continents, Africa was, uh, and is still slightly shielded from the excessive damage uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that COVID had in different other areas. Then number two, you also know that the levels of urbanization in Africa and, and, and are not as high as, as other countries, yeah? So you find that, for example, Uganda could be urbanized at about say, maybe 25, 30%. That means that a lot of the, our folks are in rural areas. They are not congested. 
and obviously they are eating very naturally and they have a lot of uh, in, in, in resistance to disease. And so thirdly, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would also say that our markets are not very complex, all right? Very complex, for example, the, the markets of rights and the markets of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of the commodities we have in our real estate market are not that complex. And so the disruption of COVID did not have the leverage of getting to the cores of how these things are working, yeah? So the major product we have, say for, say, say, say for example, in the real estate sector is uh, land, is uh, housing, is uh, office space, is industrial space, is retail space, yeah? And then obviously there are some other products here and there uh, because people are looking for financing for this, so they involve banks, they involve insurance companies, they involve, uh, you know, all sorts of consultancies for due diligence and everything. But you can, you see that our spring is relatively stable and firm, yeah? And so apart from the time that it took when we were under lockdown, where there were no transactions, where there was no public transport, where there was, a, uh, there was a difficulty to get services, the, the, the government offices were closed, so you couldn't go for any transaction and so on and so forth. It meant that things had just actually got shut down. But one of the things I just want to talk about that is likely to have a lasting impact is the uh, appetite for credit. Yeah, so first of all, many people who are in businesses such as education, entertainment, and uh, anything that involves the public, all right, uh, we are locked down substantially for long periods of time. And so many of them, if they had borrowed, they ought to have obviously defaulted on their, on their loans. So what that happened was that banks then therefore lost, lost appetite of lending. That means the supply or rather the demand of property had got to drop. And then also it meant that there was also an increase in properties that were in distress for sale or having defaulted on loans. That means that also the, the higher supply of property. So the combination of low demand and high supply obviously means that the price has to come low. But our coping mechanism has been, uh, we, we have generally been uh, preaching a sense of positivity. And we are saying, guys, this is not a, a bridge washed away. This is a simple speed bump that we didn't know was on the highway, right? And that the speed bump can be removed in a matter of, of, uh, of time. And as me and you know, real estate generally is a long-term asset. So a few months should not really create a very big problem. So our advice to banks, to lenders, and to people who are big stakeholders in the market where please hold on, wither this call together, and let's get up together. And I'd like to mention this by again referring to our, what our speaker said earlier, by saying that if you want to prosper, don't create a sea of poverty. So if any other sector wants to survive, make sure that you're able to give support to those who are having difficulty now. And how was that done? By encouraging people to borrow, by remaining positive on values, by giving opinions that this was a short-term uh, issue, the market will bounce back, and every, everyone stopped panicking. And then and at that point, I think we are now shading out of the of, of, of the worst of it, and I think we shall get a show in time. Right. Thank you very much. Normally, in any kind of valuation, we generally used to apply and tend to apply the DCF method, the discounting cash flow method, where we forecast the future cash inflows and try to discount them at an appropriate rate in order to work out the present value equivalence of the future cash flows. My question to you, Mr. Mugisha, is how do you determine the appropriate discount rate to be applied on future cash inflows with a view to working out their present value equivalence? Because the choice of discount rate has a huge impact on the ultimate valuation of any asset that you like to do derive. So going by your experience, what are one or two or three key factors which are considered while determining an appropriate discount factor while applying the DCF approach in valuation? That's a very interesting question, Dr. Gupta. And I'm, I'm really happy that you, you're asking it. So, I mean, I'll just give you an example and say, uh, if you're heading north uh, and, and anyone knows direction, no one is going to think you're heading south, right? So if you wake up in the morning, and you dress up like you're dressing for for for, a, for, for church. No one will, will ask you which 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 tennis court you're going to. 
because from your dressing it will be clear what activities you intend to achieve that day. Where am I saying this? I'm saying that the future of anything, the future of anyone does not start at this point onwards. The future begins in history, all right? So a lot of things to do with interpreting the future of something lie in you analyzing the history of that same thing. So be it a company, be it a business, be it anything. So what you'd normally like to do is you look at three or four factors, yeah? So number one would be the business itself. Look at the performance of the business in the near, uh, in the near past, say seven to 10 years, if that data is available, yeah? Because anything that doesn't have data that is, is, is later than seven years, eh, is more than seven years, is likely to be a lot of guesswork. Because within one, two, three years, you cannot be able to go through the vagaries of a business for you to understand the possibility of the future. So, so that is one thing. So past performance is obviously going to project future expectations in my view. The second thing is going to be a lot to do with the team. Yeah, the team and the mind behind whatever business that is. Yeah, you need to assess the team. To what level of expertise? To what level of understanding? What level of acumen do they seem to have in moving their product to a higher level. And if it's a team indeed, and it's a good one, it will have expansionist plans. It would have um, uh, a plan of securing its business. It would have a growth plan. So all those things come into space, in, into your thinking. You analyze your growth plan, how practical are they? How timely are they? Is it appropriate diversification and so on and so forth? Then you're able to now take a practical you know, eye and a sight into the future and say, this might work, this might not work. The other thing that you want to look out for is, is the environment that that particular business is, is in. Yeah? Some, some, some environments simply do not support growth. And even if they, they do support growth, you saying that you're professionally predicting that this company will exist in the next 10 years in an environment like, say, for example, I, I, I don't want to be specific, can be hard to say, right? You look at the governance. The governance structure of, of that company. If it's a one-man company, is there as Mr. Gupta or Dr. Gupta uh, Limited? It's a one-man company, and Gupta is probably 75 years. Are you going to forecast 15, 20 years for that company safely? Really? There are going to be some issues there. But, but if it is Dr. Gupta Limited, and he's got a board of directors, he's got a governance charter, he's got a strategic plan, he's got the, the, the books of accounts, that are, are being audited by a certain middle sized audit firm, and uh, so and he has existed for the last 15 years, and he's got a you know a, 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 a provable client base of so much, then you begin to have the confidence. Finally, I would say, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of that valuation? Yeah? And obviously, we know that the appetite of risk of anything depends on the purpose of one that particular thing for. Okay, so probably I've spoken a lot of subjective things but what i'm trying to do is a subjective objectivity yeah so everything that's got to do with the future whether you are a pastor or you are a reverend or whatever you simply cannot guarantee but what a good professional does is make sure that he can explain his uh, decision based on a certain framework of mind certain framework of things he has seen and certain framework of objectives he has put together to make sure he has a solid opinion you do that, you could be wrong a hundred times, but you'll be right and you'll be all inclusive of the decision you make. Maybe what I need to ask you now, therefore, is do we need to make this a school so that we start building the knowledge around it? Yeah, so let's make it a piece of research. And, say, and then we say that every instruction being done by everyone should be guided by the following. And whatever you arrive at, please submit to us so that we can analyze and then we can create a depository of when to apply what to make at which point. Then maybe our children in future won't have to think as hard as we have been thinking. They'll simply be playing with a model where you put in some, some, uh, some entries and it gives you an expected return to use. And then the, the, and then the, you know, the, the future will judge us from, from, from what we did and continuous development will keep improving what we are putting. I hope I've helped. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. CMA Shri Rakesh Singh Ji has some observation to make. And then we'll come to Mr. Ashok Gupta, sir. Alan, uh, I've got a couple of actually observations and I wanted to listen from you. Uh, 
Uh, one is that uh, definitely IVSC uh, has the combined wisdom of uh, all the players uh, globally. But uh, like Uganda, possibly in India also, we have got our own specific issues. Now we are also trying to resolve those issues and come out with the guidance to, for our members. Uh, possibly you are also doing in Uganda in the same manner where uh, either adoption, adaptation, and then uh, coming out with the new thing. Uh, my observation is relating to uh, actually both you, both of you, Alan and uh, Dr. Gupta. I think uh, what will be the possibility or where are the possibilities where both of us, because both of us belong, have a different legacy or rather a similar legacy. And we have got a long relationship with the uh, India-Uganda relationship has gone a very long. We have got a similar structure of our businesses also, and we have got uh, uh, streets. So how far it will be feasible if both the organizations also uh, interact with each other when we are developing our own local standards and uh, learning from each other? Because all of in India, actually, uh, though evolution standards uh, board is there, and uh, we are doing a lot of work now and uh, work is being appreciated also. But uh, we like to learn from uh, Ugandan experiences. And uh, one of the reasons is that more inputs are there, more or uh, better it becomes. That's my point number one. That uh, what would be the in Uganda and India? We join hands and uh, learn from each other. That's one. The second uh, is that uh, possibility, what would be the possibility in future? Uh, definitely after pandemic only because pandemic situation, possibly physical movement uh, is not there. I think uh, both of you should be, or rather India and Uganda should uh, explore the possibility uh, of uh, having an exchange of membership with each other. Some of our members would definitely like to uh, come to Uganda and uh, learn from your members because there is so much for uh, learning. Similarly, uh, possibly uh, uh, valuers from Uganda may like to come to India where we can be the facilitators and uh, we can uh, join hands in uh, learning uh, from each other. And uh, definitely third is a request that uh, we, uh, we are planning to hold an international conference uh, next year. Yes. And uh, I definitely request uh, on behalf of India and uh, ICMA that uh, you plan sometime. Definitely all the uh, cotton raisers will come and go, Dr. Gupta may be yes, uh, getting in touch with you because in this, uh, we would love to have you as one of, your, uh, one of the speakers. Exactly. I think it's in a little bit in advance, but yes. uh, you know, uh, uh, everyone is busy after pandemic with the economic development. I thought it fits that let me um, request you in advance on behalf of the ICMAI and India that we'll love to have you here. You are a wonderful speaker and a wonderful presenter. I think we need uh, close uh, uh, coordination with Uganda. Both of us, we must learn with each other. Uh, these were the, my initial uh, observations. Oh, sure. And I think, Dr. Gupta, you kindly explore the possibilities yes, sir. of yes. extending our uh, membership exchange yes, sir. and uh, also how we can learn from each other exactly. regarding uh, uh, issues which we have to locally uh, come out with. Yes, sir. Uh, yes sir. Other than the IVSC, of course, IVSC standards we have adopted. Thank, yes, you. Thank you. So great idea, sir, which is going to be beneficial for both India, Uganda, as well as for the revaluation professionals across the globe. And I would request Ellen to kindly consider. I'll send him a formal mail with this regard and also be in touch with him over telephone. And we can certainly look at collaborating together in building up the profession in India and Uganda, both virtually by having joint seminars, conferences virtually, as well as by physical exchange of your experts coming into India and Indian experts coming into Uganda. Of course, we can certainly look at working out some kind of an arrangement. We will talk offline and we will also exchange mails on this context, but let me have your views on this. I, I couldn't have had an earlier Christmas present uh, from uh, the Revolution Committee in India, and I'm really excited uh, that uh, you are 
uh, thinking of us in that way. I think yeah. it is something that has been uh, in the works for a very long time. The history yes. of brothers always comes to something at some point. That's and right. so I would like to just sincerely say that uh, we are both Commonwealth countries. We are both yes, uh, looking for prosperity of our, of our people. And we are both, of course, looking for advancement of our, of our professionalism. And so there is absolutely nothing in the way of a cooperation in terms of student exchange, in terms of expert exchange, and yes. in terms of knowledge exchange. So that one is absolutely welcome. And I thank you very much for thinking about it and even initiating it. And I think we shall do everything possible. I will reach out to the leadership of the, of the VPO uh, here locally, and then I'll put you in touch. And even me personally, I'll still remain uh, someone that you can reach out. So that is one. The second one is about uh, contribution in supporting each other in yes. local standard development. Yeah, so I would just like to assure our guest speaker that the International Valuation Standard Council is aware that all their member, uh, uh, their member countries have got unique local circumstances okay. in, terms of, in terms of legal regime, in terms of tradition, in terms of standards. However, what we are saying is that uh, we can all work towards what we call sharpening the rough edges yeah. and making sure that uh, we still respect sovereignty of territory, of markets. And so that is not a, a hindrance as such. It's actually a foundation on which the international violation standard practice is being used. But just to say another point that is a, a total coincidence at this point in time, um, Uganda, the government of Uganda, has just issued out a a, a request for proposals, a, a procurement uh, under the Ministry of Land, Housing and Urban Development to develop national valuation standards. So I'm sure that that assignment is going to start maybe early next year and we'll be excited obviously to come on board. I don't know at what level you are doing it, whether you've already taken off, you have a consultant at who has taken off, but we are at that point also and I'm sure we shall learn a lot. So what we can do, we can actually uh, open a formal channel of discussion between whoever will be doing it here yes. and yourselves to see how this can work. Very and good. attending, and then lastly, about attending the international conference, again, I really look forward uh, to being in, in India. I've never been to India before, uh, but, I, but uh, I hear so many good stories about India. Uh, my father was in India many years ago. I remember when he came back, he, he brought me a wallet, which I held for many years. Before. Right now, I don't know where it is. But uh, I really look forward to, to, to coming there post COVID, and I hope I'll find everyone uh, just as jovial as I found them now. I sure, you. thank you very much, sir. Mr. Ashok Gupta, sir, you have some observation to make. Kindly. Yeah. Thank you, Gupta Ji. Alan, Mr. Alan, I have one question from your country that uh, I understand and learn from that Ki Kampala has put a high property tax. Mm. So is there any impact on the property tax on the valuation and uh, the different models are there? So I should not uh, go for the lengthy question, but only just want to know whether any adverse impact on the valuation due to the property tax income. Okay, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, um, you know, uh, taxes in Africa, uh, we, we can't differentiate between taxes and sanctions, if I can say that. Uh, no one likes to pay taxes, uh, but of course, you know, a government can only survive through uh, its citizens paying taxes. And so, what we have in Africa is what we call a progressive tax system. Yeah, Pro progressive taxes means that tax those who have more, more, yeah. and those who have less, less. Which in itself is not a, a doesn't make sense because those who have more are few, and those who have less are many, and therefore few cannot feed all the many. But that's a tax system that has got to be a compromise. So one of the one of the aspects for which a government can really see success of anyone, and I think this is globally, is by how much how much real estate you have. And so the government thought that the easiest way to mobilize taxes was through uh, property tax. And so we have about five forms of tax. So one, you have what they call property rates. Property rates are levied by your municipal. So if your house is, let's say, Hyderabad and Hyderabad is a, a municipal, then you pay some little money, which is at about 6% of your rental value, to the Hyderabad Municipal Council to guarantee services to your property. That is garbage, street lighting, road maintenance, etc., etc., security, and so on and so forth. 
whether it does that job or, or not is another question altogether. So that's the first one. Then the, the, then, then the other one that, that you have is that uh, you have a, a, a capital gains tax, all right? So if you buy a piece of land at say, 10 million, and then you are in, in trade in the year 2000 and sell it at 20 million in the year 2020, you will have gained 10 million shillings. The government wants 30% of that amount of money as a capital gains tax, all right? Now, there is what they call rental tax. Rental tax. The other one was uh, property rates. The second one was the, was the capital gains. Now, rental tax. The government views that uh, if a businessman who is selling plastics or selling groceries is paying income yeah, or, or, or on, his, on his annual profits, then why, why shouldn't someone who owns property pay income on the, on the property he puts out there for, for rent. So they classify rental uh, property as a business to the landlord, all right? And they subject you to a rental tax. I think it's starting, standing at 13% of your and your rent. So whether you have a, an apartment block with six apartments and there are tenants in there, uh, uh, but the, the, the argument is that you cannot stay in six apartments. So they must be making money for you. So they also charge you for that. So what has happened is that uh, we've, we've gotten two kind of, of tiers of the market. There is one market that, I, that even you will you agree with me, it's very difficult to chase. Yeah? People in unplanned areas, people in slum areas, people in uh, emerging areas. How are you going to get there? I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the, the tax authorities are not that many, yet there are millions and millions of homes, all right? So the machinery to administer these taxes can sometimes be difficult. So what they do is that they go to notable developers, yeah? So if you're notable developers like national housing, like uh, maybe there's a shop with contractors who are known to have 200 apartments in, 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 in a city, in a small town, and, and another 200 in, in another town, they will come to you because you are identifiable and you're a big fish. So those are the ones that they can easily enforce. So at the end of the day is that the market has found a way to live with this problem, if I can call it a problem. And so you find that uh, those who are investing in the, in the high-end space, because they are visible to the government and the tax authority, tend to be very clear on making sure that they, they put on top the tax inconvenience and it later becomes a burden of the, either the buyer or the tenant or the consumer, all right? So that means that generally high-grade housing is going to be higher. But on the other hand, middle grade and low grade housing is not responsive because it's not visible to the tax authorities, and therefore those ones are very relatively cheaper. But from the point of view, who is coming, you who is coming in from a market that you don't understand, you won't tell the difference. You will simply think that low and middle end is low because of its other characteristics, which is true, and high end is expensive because of its other characteristics, which is also true, because you don't find high end housing in slum areas, all right? So with that, the whole tax thing just disappears away. So you only give it a very strong relevance and, uh, and consideration when you're making an investment decision or a buying decision. But after that, you've heard the property for quite a number of years. It just feels a way into a normal system. So I hope I'm there. Thank you. Shri Arun Gajwani, sir, you have some observation to make. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, warm good evening to all the participants. Yeah. And uh, I really thank you for the wonderful session we are going through, sir. And thank you, Mr. Bhugisha, for your uh, very informative presentation that you made. I have one question about, you know, the valuation of starters. The early stage companies, you know, we normally we find that it is very difficult for the lack of uh, the history or for the lack of the information that we have in the domain. So, uh, you know, uh, I would just uh, request for your uh, perspective out of your experience, that what essential things that we should be keeping in our mind if uh, we are asked to value any startup, uh, which is having no history or which is having no financial precedence in the domain. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mavisha. <coughs> okay, I'm um, interested. Um, uh, I, 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 I always want to respond to, uh, to that kind of question in the following way. You know, there's an English adage that says, don't count your chicks before they hatch, isn't it? 
Yeah, uh, but but between me and you, you know that that doesn't mean that professionals cannot work hard. But like I said earlier, is that uh, you need to wear very good goggles. Yeah, if you're going to take people through a walk in the darkness of the future. Yeah, because you're making very bold assumptions, which might can even collapse on day one, yet people are committed to huge funds. So what you really want to do is create your kind of mental pathway within which you're going to think as you try and convince people that you're, you're on stable ground as they walk blindly following you. And that's where really a value needs to really be at peace with himself when you're making such opinions, right? So in terms of being practical and having that frame of, God, that frame of mind uh, informing us from uh, in, in, in our background, I would say number one, that uh, you really need to understand the sector. Yeah? What sector are these people coming into? And it could be anything. It could be leather turning. It could be into soft drinks. It could, in, it could be a fintech solution. It could be anything. Yeah? So you need to understand the the terrain of that sub sector or sub sector <clears throat> and uh, by understanding the sector you're, you're going to look at a few things one is the sector growing two is the sector uh, uh, stagnating and number three is the sector declining now growth stagnation or decline in itself should not preclude you from being positive because something could be declining because they're not doing something that your startup investor wants to do. Something could be stable because everyone is complacent and doesn't know how to exploit and probably your investor is going to jump start it. In, in another way, something could be growing, but it could be growing artificially. Maybe one other person coming into the market will make it stable or make it decline. So again, it's a space that you really need numbers. And I, I like the I, I like the, the example that uh, our, our, our uh, Dr. Gu Gupta made earlier where he said, Valuation is numbers, and then we dress them up with a story, all right? So that, that is critical. So we have the numbers, but now we really need to look for the story. So I've said one thing is understand the sector. The second one is you want to look for peer entities, yeah? Either within the market, that the, 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 the geographical market that you are in, yeah? Or, or within similar jurisdictions with similar circumstances that you have, all right? So, Look, look for those peers and understand them. <laughs> the peers you'll be looking for are those who have substantially taken off. If you have access, try to understand their path, what pitfalls and what, uh, what walls did they run into and what hills they have to climb and what slopes did they find that they need a third step. <clears throat> that might, might also help. If you have sufficient resources, then you also might want to do what you call a market survey a random-based snowball, random-based market survey. Get out there, look for, if it's a sector of young people, find a space where you can find young people, and then just talk about this, these people's products. And your question is, have you ever heard of something like this? Number two, would you be interested? Number three, what kind of solution would you expect this one to give you? Number four, how much would you pay for it? If you can get genuine respond, uh, responses, it can also give you some foundation where to base uh, what you, what you are talking about. And then of course, the other thing is that, uh, that I really want, I, I like uh, uh, to uh, always give people is that uh, there might be something that is of a policy requirement within your country, or there is a project going on, or there is this, there, there could be some energy around a certain thing, yeah? Say so if, say for example, we are talking about say, uh, access for jobs for young people, all right? If you're building a platform or you're building a space that's going to allow these people to, to you know to, to, to get into a manifesto of government or a big drive society is pushing for or things like that, then there again you're able to take quick advantage, quick support, and quick ambassadors that are likely to come in to support your young business. And uh, if, if the idea is generally positive and, and expectant and it's being waited for by a lot in the market. Then again, you know that your baby is likely to be received uh, in, in, in much more, uh, you know, uh, joy than uh, than uh, than anything else. So, those you see, those are components where you want to really fish. But you really see that these are waters that are not clear, 
it's not a page number that you're going to go in the textbook and find the formula. It is things where you address your mind, you understand the idea and try and dig out for the market. Um, so that being said, really, uh, you of course border on being, on, on being wrong. But like I said uh, uh, earlier, you will only be proven wrong within the solid assumptions you would have made. If someone did the same exact thing as you, would he come up with the same conclusion? Maybe yes. But if someone didn't do anything as it in professional, that is no. So again, that's what you really want to do. These things are possible. And that and because I say, because everyone does them every time, every time. Let me, let me tell you something. The history tells us that uh, Indian doors, uh, there was a ship that was called a door that were being uh, driven by the monsoon winds moving from the coast of India, coming to the coast of East Africa. I mean, these guys, who did it the first time? You think they are right? They probably didn't arrive. The first expedition, the second one, the third, the fourth, the fifth, didn't arrive. And the only, the only reason you'd know that people haven't been successful if you don't hear, if you don't hear from them. But people still kept trying and trying and trying and trying until it became a pathway. It was easy. You just point the door in this direction, and after a few days, you'll be on the, on the, on the coast of India. So, if you want to create a path, I mean, if you want to get people into a path, just go in one direction and leave a path. Go in one direction and leave a path. Then people start following. Before you know, a road has been defined. So let us again find a way. We create a journey. Let's create a destination. And then we send the first, the first sacrificial uh, practitioner. In this case, Mr. Gajwani is going to get there, get halfway and come back and say, I couldn't get there, but I could see the promised land. The next person will get closer until we bridge it. We bridge that to look for another target and another target and another target. And before you know it, all of us are, are working in the same framework. Once we're doing the, the same framework, it's like reading the Bible. If I say Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, whether it's a Bible in India or South Africa or Kampala or New York, it will be the same, the same verse. That's the beauty of the Bible. It has its own problems of, of limiting thinking, but again, you see that it at least gives us a a platform to say the same thing at the same time. I hope I'm done. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Shri, you, sir. Shri KG Vijay Bhargia, sir, you would like to share some observation? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have one query with Mr. LM. Uh, what is the certification which is recognized for valuation assignments in Africa? Okay, very interesting question. Um, you know, Africa, Africa was colonized by, by different, uh, you know, superpowers. So we've got Commonwealth Africa, then you've got uh, uh, Portuguese Africa, then you've got the, the Dutch Africa, South Africa, which later became almost a client to Commonwealth. Then you also know that the sizable block of Africa in the north is, uh, is, 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 under, is uh, under the Arab community. And so a lot of systems are different. But if I can speak for the Commonwealth, which is uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and a few other countries in, in West Africa, then the whole of East Africa here, Kampala, Kenya, Tanzania, and then uh, maybe Malawi, Zambia, and then <laughs> down to, to South Africa, we follow the Commonwealth training, yeah? And which at this point in time requires a, a certification, a qualification at a tertiary level in land economics or, or, or real estate uh, um, uh, valuation. So, so different universities call it differently, but say in, in Uganda it's called valuation, property valuation. In Kenya they call it, uh, uh, in Tiza they call it land economics. In, uh, in, in Kenya they call it real estate after appraisal, but it generally comes down to the, to the same thing. So what happens is that uh, as a young graduate, you have to belong to uh, the professional, voluntary professional organization for at least three years. In which time we do an APC assessment and uh, assessment of professional competence exam, and when you do it, you are registered as an associate. When you're registered as, as an associate, you then qualify to be registered as a licensed valuer, and you have to renew your practicing uh, license every every year, and you've got to prove that you've attended CPDs every year in order for you to be able to to get that license renewed. However. Uh, our law requires for expert ad, uh, expert valuers coming from uh, outside the country, but also provides for temporary practicing certificates given to foreigners who are coming in on a specific assignment. 
So that again is quite simple application to prove your credentials across whichever institution you belong to, which will do a quick equivalent and are able to give you your vaccine license locally. But uh, with the ideas that uh, our chief guest is bringing on board, things like a, 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 you know expert exchange and student exchange and so on yeah, and so forth, yeah, yeah. we should at some point we should end up with some kind of reciprocal protocol whereby uh, the Indian community can come and work here and the Indian community can come and have opportunities. Sure, sure, sure. So that is what I think we shall do. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Pugisha. What is the extent of application of Valuation automated models in Uganda. Are you using WAM? I mean, automated yes. models of valuation. Yeah. Yes, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, we have attempted and piloted using uh, uh, automated models in what we call mass valuation. Yeah. And mass valuation is happening on uh, in the following areas: uh, compensation valuation uh, for infrastructure developments, so for example, roads. Uh, road expansion and new road uh, 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 projects. But then also in what I, I mentioned earlier, when I was responding to Mr. Ashok on property tax, yes, and I was telling him about the property rates, which, are, which is based on the rental value of property in each municipal. So there's what we call rating valuation, the mm. determining of the rateable value for which a property owner would pay property rates to his local, uh, to his local um, uh, municipal council. So those two are uh, mass valuation projects. And I've been, I've been seeing some ideas. They haven't yet been ratified as uh, with practice guide, guidelines by, by our, our, our standards and our, 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 our regulator. But I've seen pilots uh, being extended by Kampala City Council Authority, uh, rather Kampala, Kampala Capital City Authority, and also other, other sizable uh, projects. So, they are, they are on trial. Uh, I think they are the way to go, especially as evidence of satellite imagery is, 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 is improving. And of course, in order to manage the costs of always doing original valuation from time to time. So it has a future, but it, it, it hasn't been embraced for practical application yet. Thank you. I think uh, before we close one last uh, observation, we would like to have from Mr. Mugisha. This is regarding in valuation, as in any other profession, ethics and code of conduct play a very important role with a view to establishing credibility and stature and trust of the valuer amongst the various stakeholders. So what kind of system of framework or architecture you have in Uganda with regard to code of conduct and ethics for the professional values? Okay, yeah, so yes, again, uh, that's a very wonderful question. And I think we're, we're missing ethical issues in, in the whole discussion. You can discuss anything technical before you address ethical matters. But I'd like to mention that uh, for me, it is my view, it may, may not be a position in Uganda, but it is my honest view that uh, if you want to build uh, a, a, a tree, a stem of a tree, you do it when the tree is still young. Yeah? Yeah. Because then it, it will not be flexible to bend without breaking when the tree grows, grows older. So in a similar fashion, uh, me, I believe that ethical issues should be instilled in people from the very young age. Sure. So there is no ethics in valuation that doesn't work in ethics in medicine, and it'd be different from ethics in engineering, or different from, 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 from ethics in, in parliament, or, or different from ethics in any other space you can think about. Right. So we need to bring ethics, issues of ethics into the family and into the schools and make them part and parcel of holistic, uh, you know, uh, raising of children or holistic raising of people. They can later go ahead and, they, and specialize into different areas, but the core of understanding the right between, uh, the, the, of knowing the right between, the difference between right and wrong should start at the very early age. Then it becomes very easy. To, to preach to people, so that is one. So then number two is that uh, we do have a, then we have an, a police, mm. obviously right through training in university, you go through the course units on ethics, strictly on ethics, and also some of the APC trainings and the CPDs we do, 
have yeah. got a lot of uh, ethical issues in there and ethical content and so on and so forth. So we emphasize it. It's like going to church every Sunday to remind yourself of your faith and so on. So we also emphasize it along the way. But on the flip side of it, we also have an enforcement mechanism. Mm. Yeah? So our regulator has got a, a very clear statute that gives them powers to discipline anyone in the profession who is found to be acting outside ethics within reasonable and legal limitations. And the discipline can come in any form. It can be naming and shaming, it can be warnings which are verbal or written, it can be suspension, and it can be complete termination and the withdrawal of, uh, of confidence from an individual. So it's a whole body of, of, yeah. of, 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 of issues. But yeah, like I said, uh, they are better handled when they are young than when they are old. Because sure. it becomes very, very, very difficult to change people when they are already right. in sure. bias. Thank you very much. Any more observations from anyone, please? I think it's time to close the session now. I take this opportunity to thank Mugisha Allen from Uganda Kampala, member of membership and standards recognition board, where I also happen to be a member on that board. So we are colleagues on the board over there for IBSC. Thank you so very much for joining us today and sharing your perspectives with regard to practical aspects of valuation and specifically from your wide international experience that you have had. I'm sure our members would have hugely benefited from your inputs. Now to the idea given by the chief guest of today, we are certainly going to talk uh, offline and over mail, over telephone to build up the kind of bond that we are expecting to build between India and Uganda valuations, which exchange of faculty, exchange of expert valuers, and exchange of knowledge, exchange of thought process. We are certainly going to work on that. And very soon we'll close that and work out some kind of arrangement with Ugandan Valuation Association and we'll share that information with a whole lot of registered valuers existing in India, including the participants of today's program, so that we can all benefit from our mutual exchange and mutual professional knowledge and benefit. I thank you, Mr. Allen, hugely on behalf of our organization, as well as the present members for sparing your valuable times and giving us perspectives with regard to valuation from Ugandan profile, Uganda perspective. I also thank the chief guests of today's session, CMA Shri Rakesh Singh Ji, past president of the Institute of Cost Accountants of India and chairman of Valuation Standards Board of ICMEI RBO for being with us and sharing his very, very futuristic perspective views with regard to the future of valuation, the challenges and the aspiration. And of course, I will be failing in my duty if I don't put on record huge thanks for all the participants who have joined us in such a huge number in today's webinar. Thank you so much, sir. We get encouraged by your presence and we keep doing such kind of programs almost twice every week. We normally have these kind of events on Wednesday and Thursday or Tuesday and Wednesday and again on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Thank you so very much for patronizing and joining us time and again on our webinars, which we try to make as fruitful as possible for all of you. Good evening. Thank you very much. Namaskar.